bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. How you doing? How you doing today? It's Thursday, April 4th, 2024. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is my Friday. Why do I always say that every Thursday? Am I rubbing it in? Kind of. But uh, I work really hard, man. I do. And I so look forward to uh, not only wrapping another great week here on Fade to Black, but I get to work tomorrow and Saturday and Sunday and get ready for Monday. A lot of prep, a lot of things go on around here uh, to get things done. Uh, great day today, a busy day. Started out uh, with the news this morning, and uh, of course, I was on with Christina Gomez that I do every week on her show, Mysteries with a History, and uh, tonight, Fade to Black. So three live shows in one day, a um, lot of fun, but very busy, and also, uh, and I was reading through Renee, and Renee, you are the best. You work really, really hard, and I I'd said earlier today, Renee's been with me for 10 years, 10 years, man. 10 years and uh and the Jaime Masson uh press conference today got raided oh man by the police and the ministry of culture th there in uh Peru and so I think uh now I, I read through uh all of uh Renee's stuff today so I'm going to circle back with Christina tomorrow and if we decide that we can pull off uh, uh, a show covering this, because I think it's pretty important news. If we can do it and we can make it effective, uh, we'll try to do it uh, this weekend. Um, this Saturday, I am Ron Keel, who has been on Fade to Black, and I've been on his show too as well, is in town. And he's touring. He's on tour uh, tonight, tomorrow night. Today's Thursday. Tomorrow night, he's playing Vamped in Las Vegas, you know, the Count's uh, famous club there. He's playing Vamped. And then Saturday, he's here in town playing the Whiskey. So, fade or not, so I'm going to go see Ron Keel. Uh, that's, a, that's a really big deal for me. And I haven't seen Ron in probably close to uh, uh, not quite 40 years, but it's been a minute. It's been a minute, and he's been out doing his thing. He went to Vegas for a while um, and uh, changed his focus on, uh, well, you know, he's just, he's a musician. He's a singer. He's a front man. But he got into radio, too, as well. So he was always in a record company. So he always had his band together, but that was evolving, and the style of music uh, you know, he's got metal cowboy, you know, tattooed on his arms. Very cool. Anyway, uh, he's rolling into town Saturday night. So Brad Harris and I are going to go see Ron Keel. We're going to have a uh, dinner over at the rainbow and then, uh, swing uh, the whiskeys next door and, and go see Ron Keel on Saturday night. So, and the reason why I bring that up is for you fader knots, I'm going to go hang out with Ron Keel, and I'll keep you posted on that. Maybe we'll do a live stream from the whiskey. But um, that whole Saturday and with Brad Harris, so I don't know how we're going to squeeze in uh, something live with Christina, but uh, I'll talk it over with her, and we'll see what we can do, and I'll keep everybody posted. All right? Great week on the show this week. We had uh, Jason Quitt and Paul Seaburn on Monday. Billy Carson on Tuesday. Uh, last night, Bob Frizzle was with us. And tonight, it's John Myler. And 
been talking about tonight's show all week. It's going to be great. It's going to be an amazing conversation. We're going to be talking tonight about ETs and ancient literature and Christian ufology. Yeah, right? I dig it. I totally dig it. And I'm here to get my learn on. And this is a subject that uh, I'm very interested in. And I've had uh, many guests over the years discussing uh, this subject. And it's pretty amazing when you think about it. So we're going to be doing all of that tonight. And uh, he's the author of 13 published books, and he's known for his research in the field of Christian ufology, combination of ancient astronaut theory and end times prophecy. Wow, I cannot wait for the conversation tonight. His latest book, Christian Ufology, was featured in the New York Times. He draws from an extensive academic background with two associate's degrees, a bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, (laughs) man. An advanced military education. He began his military career as active duty Army Infantry M60 gunner during the Panamanian conflict in 1990 and retired as the Chief of Cyber Operations for the U.S. Western Air Defense Sector in 2021. His website is below on social media and over on our website, johnmyler.com. And I would like to welcome to Fade to Black for the first time. He's right there, John Myler. John, good evening. Sir, how are you? Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing me on your show. This is great. Yeah, it's amazing to have you here. And uh, before we get started, you get the first time guest disclaimer. So let's get that out of the way. Next time you're on the show, John, you don't get it. But tonight, you get it, which is this. John, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go, but you have to accept. You have to accept. Uh, Yes, I definitely (laughs) accept that. You know, um, uh, the Panamanian part, uh, now, there's a strange thing there. Um, I lived in Panama, and my dad was in the Army. I lived at Fort Amador. I went to Balboa High School, right? (laughs) And so, yeah, all of those bases. Now, when I was there from 77 to 1980, I was there for three and a half years. Um, all of the bases that was before we tra- we started when I left, we started the transfer of the canal. Okay? okay. But the first couple of years I was there, it was still the 51st state, right? Okay. It was all, it, it's the way it was. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, all of the bases there, all of my friends, all of the department of defense, the DOD and the canal zone company and all of that. Uh, we had one high school, one, we had one college, right? And so we had two football teams at each. It was like A through L, right? <laughs> and then M through Z, and we had the red and blue teams and the red and blue teams, and then we would play each other. And that's, that's, that was, wow. yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy, but uh um, when the invasion happened, um, I was down there and I saw the craziness there. It was, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, but it was a good time also to be there. I was there at the right age, but I just kind of felt that things were just a little too, what's the word I want to use? I, I think the word is corrupt. It was a little out of whack down there, but things stayed in balance. Um, but you were part of that. And where did you drop in uh, or were you already stationed there? So the uh, Rangers went in, they took over the airfield uh, and the right after the airborne dropped, we came in right after them and took their positions. So uh, did you go into Howard Air Force Base? We did do convoys to Howard, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then we were stationed at uh, Sherman for a, a good chunk of that. So we were doing convoys all across the place. And then for part of it, we did patrols throughout the city. Um, and that that was just so surreal, seeing all these buildings and cars on fire out in the street. And It was surreal for me, too. Yeah, it really it was. was. It was, it was it, it, the, um, I'll tell you, uh, something really funny and then we'll get started on, on the show tonight. 
There's a new TV show. Have you seen Three Body Problem? I, I have not. Uh, you've heard of it, right? A crime type show or something? Or? No, no, no. It's a uh, alien invasion series. Uh, it's oh. Chinese, and it's on Netflix. So, okay, you haven't seen it. I don't want to spoil it for you, but there is a scene in the Panama Canal, and okay. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it right there. And it, it was so traumatizing that scene in the Panama. Now, look, man, I've seen it all. You've been there. You've seen it all, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. it, takes a, it takes a lot to stun me. It really does, especially with like an alien invasion thing. I sat there for 15 minutes after that scene like I was hit in the head with a ball-peen hammer. Yeah. What's it, what's it called? Three-body what? Problem. Three-body problem. Man, don't mess around. Just just get it done this weekend. It's eight episodes. Yeah. Just get it done. Get it done. It's a game yeah. changer, man. Yeah, Panama uh, got enough things out there without aliens or whatever. <laughs> that, that place is dangerous. <laughs> man. You know, and uh, I got to say, um, I went, okay, a friend of mine, this is, this is really weird. Let's jump right into UFOs. So... Uh, when I was down there, the drummer in our band in high school, his name's Javier, Javier Cedeno. And Javier now lives near me here in Los Angeles. And so we, we always stayed in contact over the years, right? And uh, and I, I go off and I'm doing my thing and I've got my TV shows and radio, you know, and I got all in. But he's watching and he's following along. And then he comes out to my house one night, and we're having a cookout. And I've got Jason Martell is there from Ancient Aliens and some other people. To, I don't want to name drop it. We're all sitting there, and, and Javier's having a good time. And then Javier turns to me and says, now, when Javier and I were hanging out in Panama, I was we were like 15 years old, 15, 16. Okay? And, um, and he turns to me. In front of everybody there, and he goes, Man, remember that night you saw the flying saucer? I go, What? And he goes, Man, we were out in the jungle, man. It was me, you, Alan, Rocky, Bill White, you know, our group, our circle. And he goes, And you pointed up and you go, Look, man, uh, a UFO. And we all looked, and it was right there, and it was silver, and it had lights going around. I go, What are you talking about? He goes, Jimmy. You and this, and he tells the whole story, and I don't remember it. Wow. I don't remember it at all. I want to remember it, and and it just takes you into that zone. Was I abducted? Makes right? you wonder, yeah. What else <laughs> yeah, were, yeah. am I not remembering and everybody else at that point? Matt, he gets somebody on the phone, you know, one of our friends. It was Rocky. He gets Rocky on the phone. Rocky, remember that time we saw the UFO? Yeah, church saw it. He pointed. I was like, dudes, what are you guys talking? I don't remember. I don't, but they yeah. were they were very and what you know, it's something like that, uh, a memory that I could have from Panama, and I don't have it. I yeah. don't. I don't I have got it. it. My most one of my most astounding paranormal experiences was there in Panama. What happened? Yeah. So when I was in the Army, um, of course, throughout my youth, I was really into paranormal stuff, uh, and it dates back to when I was five years old. But um, And my sister was into, like, ghosts and stuff like that. And um, seeing that I was curious about this stuff, my mom bought me this set of encyclopedias uh, of the paranormal from Reader's Digest. And I read the whole thing. I pretty much had it memorized, uh, this encyclopedia of the paranormal, literally. In my head uh since i was a little kid you know and um i just absorbed these books and stuff you know and any show about the paranormal that you in search of with leonard nimoy right? right so i'm a little kid just like sucking all of this stuff up um and uh i kind of went to the when i went into the army i was like that in it made me kind of an oddball intellectual being in the infantry because, you know, those guys only have like three conversations, uh, cars, women, 
and um you know rock and roll or something you know so right 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 a couple right. things that you could talk about that are sort of legitimate conversation stuff with your you know your typical infantry neanderthal guy um but uh, i was more the on the intellectual side so i was uh what what you call an intellectual barbarian or, or a nerd barbarian or something uh so i had all this interest in ghosts and stuff and it kind of labeled me and and uh they picked on me a lot teased me a lot uh always made fun of me and everything so i never caught the end of it right i was in a cohort unit so i was with these guys the same group of guys for three years i couldn't get away from it and um when we went to uh panama uh we were in out in the jungle around fort sherman so behind the base they had um a zoo with animals that they caught in the jungle right there you know python uh, big cats, uh, you know, <laughs> and jungle uh, stuff, jungle, yeah, stuff, yeah, jungle yeah. stuff. And then yeah. they use it to train the, the troops before we go out and risk our lives in the land navigation exercise with, you know, carpet of ants and, you know, all the stuff they have out there. It, it's just insane. Uh, land nav just doesn't really work very well. And, um, that base didn't really need us out there in the jungle posted on the perimeter because the jungle was better than a fence. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. It, 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 <laughs> yes, yeah. Until you've experienced a Panamanian jungle, you don't know. You, you will don't. be eaten alive by the bugs and what the bugs don't eat, the plants will sting you. And, you know, and, and that's, it's, you know, never mind the Quatamundi or running around there stealing your food, the monkeys or whatever. And, the um uh what do you call it you know the gigantic snakes and big cats and stuff like that you know um yeah we had guys chased by bushmaster snakes and and um yeah I, I, saw, I saw all of that down there and and i've talked about it so we're going to get to your paranormal thing yeah, here in a yeah, second so, but I, I have talked about you just mentioned it and and i've tried to have people understand what i'm saying I'm standing in the jungle with my friends and I hear this like loud static, right? And I was like, mm -hmm. man, what is that? And it was just loud. And we are talking loud over this static. And I go, do you guys hear that? And he goes, those are ants. Yeah. What are you talking about? And he goes, it's an ant trail, an ant trail. And we walk over, dude. And it was like three feet wide, right? Uh -huh. Just cutting through the jungle. I don't know how many trillions of giant ants walking it like on a freeway. Yeah. And I came across I, a, <laughs> an area that was about maybe uh, three or 400 square feet of ants about two to three inches thick, like yeah, a carpet. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I've tried to describe this. They don't get it. Yeah. You know, so the things you hear in the jungle and and it's predatory, it's gnarly, and it sounds really painful. Somebody is getting the bad end of something all the time in the yeah. jungle. So yeah. anyway, okay, so back to your paranormal experience. What happened? So it's about midnight. It's getting close to the end of my shift. And I they have this thing called sheet lightning out there where the sky is just this sort of haziness all the time. And it's I don't know if it's clouds or what, but it's just this sort of haziness. And you see these like fluttering lights up in the sky, like just sheets of light going out. So it's not like streaks of lightning, but sheets of lightning, like maybe in a cloud, a hazy, foggy cloud type stuff that just lights up in patches. And this had been going on throughout the you know past couple of days. So that was nothing new, uh, but something was going on in the jungle in front of me about three, 400 yards out that I was filtering it out because I was used to seeing this activity in the sky and it was something that was flashing on and off this light and it was headed in our direction. And it finally caught my eye when it was a couple hundred yards out because it was brighter and it was lower. It was down under the canopy in the jungle <laughs> rather than up in the sky. And, uh, it finally caught my inch, attention and I'm looking and when it was you know, maybe a hundred feet away or so, or no, more like a, a hundred yards away or so, I actually saw this ball of light and it was about the size of a soccer ball and it was pure energy like electricity. 
and it was extremely bright, like a camera flash. So if you can imagine a camera flash where the bulb is the size of a soccer ball, right? it's about 30 feet off the ground, and it would flash on and just, and then that's it. it, it it's just an instant flash like a camera, and then it wasn't there. Uh, so every time it flashed on, which was about every 30 seconds or so, it was closer. So it was making a beeline straight to our position. And it was me and my corporal. And uh, I'm just like getting intrigued. Like, what's this? You know, so I'm going through my catalog, you know, okay, it's not swamp gas. That's usually kind of a greenish color. And it's like a haze. It's not probably not ball lightning because ball lightning, it's usually a lot smaller than that. And ball lightning zips around erratically until it hits something and diffuses. It doesn't just flash on and off, you know, right? like some kind of a probe or something. So I keep watching it, and this thing's getting pretty darn close. You know, it's maybe 100 feet away. Uh, so I got a good look at it, and I'm like, this is really unusual. I had night vision goggles, AM PVS 7s. I'm looking through them. I'm not seeing anything when it's not flashing. It's like not there. Really? And I can't. it's not making any noise whatsoever, and it's invisible when it's not flashed on. So I go and wake up my team leader, and this guy was the ringleader of the people who would taunt me the most. I mean, he would always punish me, always give me all these extra duties, drop me for push-ups and elevate my feet against a wall, um, just always picking on me. And um, half the time, it, you know, it's because of paranormal stuff because it dates back to when we did our first land navigation exercise. Uh, we had like two hours to kill, and we're just sitting out there in the woods. This was like the first two weeks of me being in that unit. And I'm just sitting there in the woods and I'm like thinking to myself, you know, this is kind of like a camping trip, right? We just don't have a fire. And we got all this time to just sit here and kill. So I just figured I'd ask a question that, you know, what do you do in a camping trip? You tell ghost stories, right? So I asked the corporal, uh, this is in the past. I, I said, um, you ever seen a ghost? And he flipped out. And the question to him was so out of context that they all started laughing and making fun of me. And this was from my first two weeks in the unit. So that's probably where the label first got stuck on me as being a weirdo and people making fun of me for being interested in the paranormal and stuff. Um, other things I did, I was kind of asking for it. I had this like little shrine practically in my bedroom of all these paranormal books, crystal balls, tarot cards, and all this other stuff, you know. So they just kind of, you know, that just carried with me. So here I am now in this new situation. I'm in the jungle and I see this, this ball of light coming toward me. This ain't in any, in any biology textbook, you know, whatever this is, there's no explanation for it. It's not, sure. ball light. it's not, you know, what is this? So I go to wake him up for his shift. Right. And I say, uh, by the way, there's this glowing ball of light over here. And it's, it's coming right in our direction and just nothing like that in this world that I know of. And trust me, I know a lot of other worldly stuff. And, uh, but it's my shift is done. So you're on, I'm crashing. And then at first he's like, hell if you are. But then he, he realizes he's like, oh, you know, I, I, he thought I was joking with him and trying to play a prank on him, right? By getting scared. Cause we're in the middle of a jungle. It's midnight, you know? Invasion uh, <laughs> going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and right as he's he's uh, cussing me out, I said, uh, no, actually, there really is something over there. And as I said that, it flashed, right? And he's like, what was that? And I said, that was it. You know, keep your eyes over there. You'll see it. It flashes about every 30 seconds. So sure enough, it moved a little closer, flashed again. And he's his eyes are getting all saucery and he's kind of shaken and he's kind of like, what the hell should we do? Should we radio the other people? But then, you know, then it'll sound like we're scared or something or whatever, you know? So he's debating how to, how to handle this. Whereas I'm just getting more curious. And, um, I'm, um, this thing gets all the way up to about 30 feet away from us. Really? And then it stops and it keeps flashing in the same spot. It's not moving. 30 so, feet, 30 feet, roughly 30 feet. Yeah, about that's, that's pretty close. That's pretty that's close. Pretty close for something that's that powerful. I mean, if 
I, and I was already reasoning out in my mind, if this thing were to strike me, it would probably kill me instantly. It looks like it's pure electricity. Uh, and I was wearing my M60. I had 750 rounds of ammo. And the first thought in my mind was, I probably don't want to be wearing this. If anything, it'll attract that electricity. Now, I also had my radio, uh, Prick 17, with a six-foot pole antenna or whip antenna on it. And I'm like, that's like an antenna rod. And then it, the backpack was full of lithium batteries, these big ones, right, for the radio. And I'm thinking, that's definitely not ball lightning because I have all kinds of stuff here. This weapon, that radio with the antenna and the batteries, and the ball lightning is just sitting there. It came all the way over here from the jungle, and it's just staying there, flashing on and off. And everything about it was resembling intelligence. And so I tell this to the corporal. I'm like, this thing is acting like it's, it's checking us out. It's acting intelligent. And... Uh, He's like semi-catatonic. I take off my weapon and he's all pissed because I'm taking my weapon off. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Shoot a ball of light? A lot of good that's going to do. And um, so then I say, you know what? I'm going to communicate with it. And <laughs> he, he, he loses it, right? He's just like basically gave me a direct order not to. And I said, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. I didn't care because at this point I'm like, who gets an opportunity to be James D. Kirk, right? This is first contact. So I walk out into the little bit of a clearing that there was there. And I introduce myself. I say, look, it may not look like it, but I come in peace. You see, I put my weapon over there. Um, even though it's time of war and everything, I want you to know that I have nothing against you. I'm here in come here in peace and I'm just introducing myself to you and I would like to know, you know, who you are and would you please reveal yourself to me? And so I'm standing there and, you know, about the 30 seconds goes by, but it doesn't flash like it's been doing on this regular interval. And I'm like thinking, uh Oh, what did I do? And suddenly I feel this presence. So it's that feeling of being looked at, but amplified by like, ridiculous i mean this thing whatever it was it was like i am here i could feel exactly where it was at and i felt it moving toward me so i started taking a couple steps back and i'm telling the corporal i'm like oh shit it's it's moving toward me it's moving toward me i don't know how i know but i feel it and I you couldn't see an outline you can't see anything nothing I even lift the goggles. And I'm uh, that was my next question. Mm -hmm. When you're that close, I have sevens, by the way. Okay. I've yeah. got a pair. Yeah. And uh, uh, they're, they're like 3.5s. Well, they're seven, the PV7s, but, uh, you know, some call, uh, there isn't an actual four, but there is, you know, threes and then a three plus. And that's what I have, okay. the three plus. And so I'm sure that's what you, well, what year was this? This was 91. So you probably 19, had 1990, 1990. You had, those were probably twos, but still really good. Really good. I've yeah. got a pair of twos as, as well. Anyway. So, yeah. but it, 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 those amplify, you can yeah, see do. anything with them. Oh, yeah. And so you pull the goggles down. It's 30 feet in front of you. You're guessing and still nothing. Yeah. I'm not seeing anything, but I feel it. And wow. somehow it, had some kind of rudimentary communication that it sent to me telepathically to let me know exactly where it was located. I felt its presence. So there wasn't any kind of language I know of, but it definitely let me know exactly where it was at, even though I could not see it. I could feel it. I could feel it moving toward me. And I lifted the goggles and I was narrating as I'm like looking. And uh, I told him, I feel it moving. I feel it moving toward me. It's coming right toward me. It flew right over my head and I felt it like my hair is kind of tingly, you know. I did a complete 180. So it kind of lowered and went right over my head and then it went behind me about 30 feet. And while I'm looking through the goggles, I said, I don't know how I know, but the next time it's going to flash, it's going to flash right there. And when I said the word there, it flashed exactly where I pointed. 
like on cue. So that got me really excited because I was just chattering and babbling and telling them, did you see that? You know, this thing it actually even flashed when I pointed where I pointed and, and when I said the word there and it's, it's acting like it understands me. So that was the grand, you know, the grand finale of it because it didn't actually turn into a human or anything crazy like that. It just let me know that it was a sentient being and it let me know where it was at. And I, I definitely felt the power coming off of this thing. I have every impression to believe that this thing could have killed me if it wanted to. It was very powerful. The presence that it emanated was like really strong and very intimidating. So it took a lot for me to stand my ground and just keep my cool and not just freak out. <laughs> Did the corporal say, uh, let, let's, uh, uh, then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, a, that's an amazing, amazing experience. But the next day, did the corporal say anything? Did you guys write it up? Yeah, I brought did, it up. Okay. The next so, day I brought what? it up. I kind of did it a little bit strategically because it ended up doing actual a complete perimeter. It, it flashed on and off and it went around all our perimeter, a whole 360. And then it went down into the jungle and it did the same thing to the other two positions further down in the jungle. So I was like, waiting to touch bases with these two guys where, you know, with these, these other two teams. And when we got together, I said, so did you guys see a glowing ball of light in the jungle last night flashing on and off? And they were like, eh, yeah, they didn't want to talk oh, about it. They didn't want to okay. talk about it. But they did, uh, they did acknowledge it. And I said, yes, wow. they did. And then I said to, to my corporal, I said, you do know that that's not in any biology textbook. There's nothing like that known to exist. I couldn't even see it in my night vision goggles. And um, and he looked at me and he said, well, you summoned it. And then they all started laughing and started teasing me and mocking me about summoning this thing, like I'm some kind of wizard or something. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You guys are not even re at least the remote bit of interested in what this otherworldly thing was i mean who can say that they encountered some otherworldly thing and even try to communicate with it he had some kind of interesting story that he could have talked to uh, about but instead he decides to make fun of me and then turn it into you know this mock fest so whenever i brought it up they would just start making fun of me and so i basically like there's no point in in talking about it because it just turns into ridicule so I let wow, it that's, go. That's, that's a really good. Now, I'll, I'll, uh, one comment as we move on. What you experienced has been experienced by civilizations for thousands of years. Yeah. Right? Now, they, they'll use other words for it. You know that. We'll be talking about all of that tonight. Different cultures, different belief systems are going to look at it uh from a different perspective you modern military right and uh on, on patrol and in that kind of situation you're going to assess it a little bit differently um but it's the same thing that's been going on for thousands of years under so many different names yeah uh i i was avid uh, uh dungeons and dragons player back then and uh, I even became a dungeon master for a couple of years. So I, I had all these books memorized, the uh, Deities and Demigods, the Monster Manuals. Uh, I had three versions. Uh, I knew uh, Gamma World, Arduin, several versions. But the the original Dungeons and Dragons uh, written by Gary Gygax, he, he, was, uh, he studied ancient legends and stuff. So he didn't just make those things up. He took these ancient legends and then just added attributes and stuff to make the game. Uh, that particular creature that I saw fit the exact description of Will o' the Wisp, uh, which is, uh, I believe, an Irish folklore or Scottish folklore. And um, there's a CGI cartoon called, um, what do you call it, um, Brave. And they actually feature a Will o' the Wisp in that, in that uh, cartoon movie. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's it. It's kind of like that. Except that one was a little, a small little one, like, not even as big as a baseball. The one I saw was, was, was pretty big and it flashed, you know, instant, like it was taking pictures or something. Wow. 
Yeah. Wow, that's a that's a great experience. That's a great experience. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the idea of Christian ufology, it's almost like, and I've said this so many times, right? It's almost like it shouldn't go together, but then it should. Yeah. I am going to I'm going to make a quick comment. When I was 20, 21 years old, I decided to read the Bible, not from a religious perspective. I wanted to be able to uh, engage in conversation if somebody brings it up. You always hear people, oh, you know, act it like, but, yeah. but they act like they know what, the, or, or maybe they do, but I certainly didn't because I've never taken the time to read it. So I thought, ah, you know what? I'll treat it like a book. I'll just read it. So there, you know, grabbed it, read it. Uh, took me a minute, right? Yeah. When I finished it, I flipped it over and I started reading it again. And I got about halfway through. And I started to, on my second run through, started to go, well, now I see why movies are made about this. It, it's a pretty good adventure story. It's got It's got everything in it, right? Yeah, And then it hit me, it ain't, this is about aliens. <laughs> it's just it's this thing. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like halfway through and I started to do this mind play with myself as I'm reading it, just interchange words. Right. It reads like Star Wars to me. It does. It does. It does. And I remember closing it and finishing it going, well, that's. It's a book about alien contact. And this was 40 years ago. This is, you know, quite a while ago. And I, I never really talked about it with anybody, but to hear this, this idea start to develop um, out there in the community and these ideas put forward, I was kind of relieved because I thought it was just me and I thought it was a fun thing, but I'm not too far off the mark. Am I? No. You're not. Uh, there's a fine line, though, between seeing that and still being able to be a Christian or seeing that and saying, well, I think it's I'm going to interpret this and take God out of it and then view it without God. And that is probably 99 percent of your ancient astronaut perspective, except for the fair, you know, few rare exceptions like Timothy Alberino, you mentioned and I know a few of a few others, uh, but for the most part, uh, ancient astronaut theory is you know they say that uh, God is mistaken identity. You know it's it's not God. It's 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 aliens that created humanity. They seeded us here. They've been tweaking our DNA, and you know they created us. And you know, but then you have to ask the questions. Well, but the Bible says the same one who created the heavens and the earth, like heavens being outer space, the abode of the sun and the moon and the stars, like all creation, period, uh, are multidimensional universe. Uh, and that's another distinction. I'm different than on some Christians because I see all of the different dimensions that could possibly exist as being part of the heavens, part of God's creation. And God himself, the Father, is outside of all of that. He's outside of time space. And no one can claim to have that creator title like he, because, you know, aliens could tweak our DNA, sure, and God could assign like angels, which I think are aliens, both good and evil, faithful and fallen, just like the Bible explains, but God delegates. I mean, when you see all the things that God does in the Bible and the way he delegates, like huge things, like, right off the bat, he creates Adam and Eve and says, I'll give you dominion over this entire planet. It's yours. You're in charge. And then he leaves, you know, and, and they're supposed to take care of things. And uh, he left it to them. He gave them instructions. He told them the truth. And next thing you know, Satan shows up and they drop the ball. Uh, but, you know, it's that's nothing that God didn't know because he... And another thing that people commonly get kind of incorrect about the Bible is the way that it describes the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Jesus said it, and the Apostle Paul, uh, John said it without getting too religious. He said, Jesus said, no one has seen the Father except me. He also said, before Abraham was, I am, which is the title that the burning bush told to Moses. So that burning bush and all those encounters that Moses had, that was with Jesus before he was even born. So Jesus, and the Bible also says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. So the Father spoke Jesus' creation into being in Mary's womb. Then after Jesus was born, lived, died, was resurrected, he traveled back in time and created all creation. Well, see, now, now if, if, if I just stop you right there, that is Isaac Asimov, right? That's Gene Roddenberry. That is Arthur C. Clarke. That is George Lucas. Right? That is Steven sort Spielberg. Of. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can actually see that. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna take it one step further. That whole burning bush thing. All right. You can take it literally. You can take it as metaphor. You could also take it as a camera flash in the jungle in Panama. And and that's that's the way that it's translated and told and recorded is through the lens of that time period. Yeah. But well, I mean, uh, angels use chariots, right? So th it's not a stretch. I don't think it's a stretch to say that angels and aliens are the same thing. I mean, that's right. they use it, technology. It, they fly in these these vehicles to get from A to B. The word heavens, shamim in Hebrew, uh, 657 times used in the Bible, the bulk of those uses refers to the abode of the sun and the moon and the stars. And you have all of these scriptures that talk about the hosts of heaven, right? That literally translates life, intelligent life in outer space. That's right. So it does. It does. So the Bible's talking all about this, but the Bible is also distinct in, in saying, you know, there is a God. And if there's any phrase that is repeated throughout the Bible, all throughout, from Genesis all the way to Revelation 14.6, it's that God, the creator, keeps telling people, I am the Lord. So he doesn't want them to forget or get mixed up or confuse these angels, his creation, as being him. Because a lot of them try to take that role and assume it. Starting with the devil, Lucifer got big in his head, you know, well, I think I could do a better job of being God. And that's what started this big rebellion. And uh, there's some really cool passages in the Bible, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. You want to read those. I mean, Ezekiel 28, before Lucifer sinned, he walked in the garden of God. So his abode was here on this planet, in the garden of God, in Eden, it says. So he lived in the garden of Eden. It says he had a throne, which means he was a king. He had a kingdom. He had a kingdom and he had subjects. I believe his kingdom spanned beyond this earth. He it spread out through all this cosmos here. You know, he had a civilization on Mars, he, probably Saturn, a moon base, you name it. That was all part of his ancient kingdom, and it was potentially billions of years old. You know, millions, but maybe even billions. It could be that old. It would have to be. It would yeah. have to be. It would have to be. It, just if we, um, oh, by the way, I can't let this get away from me. I mentioned three body problem earlier. You're going to watch it this weekend. Okay. I, I guarantee it. And you're going to finish it. I'm going to spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you one thing. The aliens call themselves Lord. Yeah. Yeah. A surprise. Yeah. 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 And it's a little, it's a little, it's a little twisted and it's a little disturbing, uh, especially because this is this is also a Chinese uh, TV series. It's a, it's a made by Netflix. It's an American TV series, but it takes place in China and around the world, right? Okay, okay. so you don't have to worry about that part. But not but all alien invasions start in America. That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. And so to 
to to see these references uh, to ET aliens. Now they say extraterrestrials; they do say that. But those that are in contact, I don't want to give away. Uh, I'm not actually. Um, but those that are in contact, humans, us here on Earth, mm-hmm. refer to ET as Lord. And when they're speaking to ET, and they do, they say, "My Lord." My mm-hmm. Lord, what would you like us to do today? It's like, man, this is this is twisted, man. This is yeah. really twisted. So, yeah, you're going to enjoy that part of it. Which now, so 13.8 billion years. Um, if we look at it in those terms, which I don't believe so. By the way, I think time is infinite. I don't think there was an origin point at three thirteen point eight billion years ago. There was something here before that. But that intelligence, that creator, whatever name you want to give it, um, we are not a- an accident. DNA is not an accident. Life is not an accident. There's an intelligence there, and that intelligence existed and exists for forever right and will be here for forever too does that does that line up with christian ufology well god is forever so the the word it's it's hard to say the word like because we're in linear time we use words like before time right which is a paradox because you can't have before time you're either within a time construct or you're not to say before time is still referring to time. You're just stretching it out a little further. And you're saying before this, you're like over here now. That's right. And, you yeah. know, that's still time. No, we can't even conceive of this, but I see God, the father as being like outside of time space altogether. And he spoke himself a body into his creation. Once he created a place you know, that we call space, time and space, then he created a body for himself, and then he populated it with life, with that body as being the first one, and then he made other forms of life throughout the cosmos. And that's pretty much how the Bible describes it. Um, that, you know, Genesis 2-7, God made Adam and Eve from the dust of the earth, and he breathed life into them. So there could be some sort of like, uh, well, I mean, he's God. He spoke. And these atomic structure came into existence out of nothingness. So he could do anything. Uh, but there's interesting things you see in the Hebrew, like different word used for make or made as opposed to create. To create something in Hebrew, and the word that used there is to create something out of like nothing that pre-existed before. To make something is to take pre-existing material and mold it into something. So... Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, right? That's create. Uh, But then other things where he's talking about, you know, I made this, I made that. That's all throughout that Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 narrative. But he bounces back and forth. The word he used for creating man is the create word, not the made word. When he breathed life into him, it's a new creation. Like, this is a brand new thing that didn't... Oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this, and uh, we're going to take a break in, in about 10 minutes. So let me ask you this. E.T., whoever, shows up here in a craft. Don't have to talk to that's not what I'm referring to. But they have came from somewhere. Yep. On that planet, in that star system, does Jesus exist? Do they yeah. have a Do they have a Christmas? And 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 the story of Moses and and everything that is here and Abraham that is in our Bible that took place on this earth. Well, what about out there in Zeta Reticuli? Or you know what I mean? Do, 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 do they cool have question. the same story? No, you're thinking along the lines that I did because I became a, a firm believer. When I was 21, I got out of the army, and then I had this encounter uh, with Jesus. Um, So the reality of the spiritual realm became so in my face. I mean, it was always real to me, the spiritual realm. Um, But now it was real, and he had a name. 
And, uh, you know, a, a big, huge mystery was just unlocked because I had a personal visitation. And I, I couldn't have been, ever been convinced of these things. The way I was living my life and the things I was doing, I wasn't changing. And I was on a pretty downward spiral trajectory. And being 21 years old, I believe he stepped in my life at the age of accountability. And I was right there on the cusp when he was cutting me some slack. I also believe my great grandmother might have had something to do with it. Um, so my great grandparents were evangelists. Um, they traveled the country with the big tent revivals for 30 years, right? But it was my great grandmother that set me on this journey in the beginning because she was the one that said she saw a UFO when she was a little kid. So I had these two opposing views that she didn't have a problem with it. ETs could be real, God's real, no problem, you know. Um, but for me, as we started progressing like into the through the 70s, into the 80s, and into the 90s, it becomes more and more like if you believe in ETs, you automatically are endorsing evolution. You automatically are falling back to panspermia, which, you know, that started with the Greeks way back when, that we were seeded on this planet by life from outer space. And the whole scientific aspect of it just totally, you know, throws down the, the Christianity part. Like, they're just completely incompatible. But and, are, uh, they, are they really? They're not. They're not. They're not. But that's it, why it, I it, set it, myself, it, you know, I had to reconcile this out right. detail by detail. And like you, I started reading the Bible when I had my encounter. I'm like, well, okay, I got to read the Bible. You know, that's what Christians do. Genesis <laughs> chapter 6, very first, you know, two pages or so in, I'm reading about these angels mating with humans and having children that were genetically different. And they were powerful, like they were imbued with supernatural power, some of them. They were men of renown, it says, Genesis chapter 6. And I'm like, the first time I read that, I'm like, holy cow. I remember hearing a story about David and Goliath, and I never questioned, you know, this giant. I just thought he was a big guy. But no, he was like ridiculously big, genetically different, six fingers, six toes, genetic weirdo. And it was at that point that I like, I know what I'm reading here. These Nephilim, they're hybrids. They're, they're right. part, part something else, part human. And then, of course, according to the book of Enoch and the book of Jasher, they're, they're part animal and part angel, too. And that's why demons, the word demon, Raphaim, right, translates as angel or, or, or translates as, as giant, you know, one of these hybrids. And it also translates as, as devil or demon. So basically, a demon is a ghost of a Nephilim hybrid. So I, 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 let's stay on this. I love this because it, last month, doesn't matter what I was talking about, but the movie I, Noah comes up and I had made this comment. Well, if you really watch it, if you really watch it, it's science fiction. Really, really watch Noah. Now they paid uh great detail to stay accurate to the Bible in that movie. And I get that. I get that. But watch it for real. It's science fiction. So after I brought it up on the show, I literally I was like, man, you know, I'm going to watch Noah. And I watched it again. And check out how the watchers are dealt with in Noah. They're aliens. Yeah. Those are aliens. So that's sure. E.T., that is ET. Everything about the the whole now, they weren't rock creatures, you know. Uh they were literally hybrids. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah and, but yeah. honestly, I think they would have had a much better movie if they would have had Nephilim what they what they really were. Uh first of all, giants. That was one of the more common ones, giant humans. And they were vicious. They were known as cannibals, typically. I mean, they they didn't have a shred of goodness in them. They were completely consumed by evil, but they also had all these other part animal part. And these are all the cryptids we have nowadays, right? A lot of them have survived. And some of them are what you could call transgenic species. They're able to alter their molecular structure and then pop in and out of this dimension. So you imagine, so we got so many examples now that we can look at in movies to explain these things. Cause we like intuitively know in Lord of the Rings, Frodo, he puts on this ring, right? And he's like here, but he's not. Everybody sees him just, poof, he's gone, right? Now he sees them and yep. he's still there. 
but he's not. He can run, walk around and manipulate things and do whatever, but he's not really there. Take that another step further, and let's say you twist the ring or something. Maybe you can actually walk through walls or walk through trees because you're shifted. You're, your atomic frequency, it changes, right? Well, these angelic beings with a lot of glory, with a lot of power, they can do that at will innately. Like we can jump into a swimming pool and hold our breath and swim underwater for a little while. Then we got to come up for air. Well, they can like sort of, you know, just will their genetic, their, their atomic structure to change and they just pop in and out. And, um, you know, that's what I think like a Bigfoot can do, for example. That's why they're so stealthful. They could just, they're there one second. They're not there the next. They're there and then you smell them and it stinks really bad and then pff, they're gone right? And how could something that big be so stealthful? And and why do we not find their, you know, remains or whatever? Well, A, they live out in the middle of nowhere, but B, are they even really fully here? When are they physical? Them, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When we yeah, see them, yeah. they're popping in and out and stuff. And these, these um, Nephilim were, were all of that. So now when, when you talk about demons, right? People who talk about who, who have seen them or who have had near-death experiences and actually experienced visions of hell or whatever. They talk about creatures that like have horns typically. They'll typically be like a part human, part animal looking thing. Uh, look at Baal. He was a, a minotaur, right? Greek mythology and then Canaanite mythology, the same thing. A man's body, a bull's head, the centaur, a horse body, a human torso, all these weird pan, this goat human set from Egypt, the dog head uh, or the bird head, you know, Anunnaki were like that too. Um, so all these religions and stuff refer, these ancient religions and mythologies all refer to these different types of Nephilim. So they're all over the planet. And I believe they really were uh, creatures that were like that all over the planet. And the Smithsonian, it probably was collecting them. But here's another interesting thing that I talk about in my book is the theory, because everybody always wants to say, OK, if there was really that, then how come we don't have their bones or whatever? Well, the Bible does talk about something interesting with bones, that residual energy of the person that used to inhabit that body is somehow kind of still stuck with those bones. Now, is it the is it the whole ghost? Is it the person or is it some kind of residual energy? We don't know 100 percent. but in the Bible, like uh, Elijah's body, his dead body was in a tomb and somebody accidentally dropped a dead body and it rolled into the tomb and touched Elijah's bones and he was resurrected from the dead. That's how much power, divine glory, power, residual energy was still in his bones. Now let's take an opposite view of that. What if a Nephilim, when it dies, its bones are so toxic that a there's a demon thing around them all the time and it could possess you take you over and one of the common things they'll do is cause people to kill themselves or become psychotic mass murderers um doing all kinds of horrible things because those creatures were just like pure evil and these bones they could probably do that they probably also make you sick Demons and diseases are related. They're connected together. Every time Jesus did healings, he would cast out demons, like left and right. And you're reading this in the New Testament, you're like, dang, how many demon-possessed people are there? That's kind of rare these days, at least we think. But he was casting them out all over the place. And, and it, it's like a regular sickness. It, a lot of the times it would be little kids. So people would be getting possessed, and it wouldn't even be anything they were doing wrong in their life. It, it, it's a condition. It's an energy that's around us. If you go into a bad place that's got it, you could touch the wrong object or go into the wrong place and get infected with it. And you have to have like a spiritual cleansing to get it off of you or out of you. Now, apply that to these bones, and you're talking about a major concentrated element of this residual energy that's very, very toxic, very deadly. So what would happen in a place where you got these archaeologists, they're like, oh my gosh, look at this weird thing, this dog head uh, with a human body. And they pull it out. Next thing you know, the archaeologist is losing his mind and committing suicide. And people start dropping like flies. 
We know just a little bit about that from the curse of Tutankhamun. Yeah, the curse of the mummy. We've all seen that movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, Multiply I've been to that. Egypt. I've been to Egypt. I got mm -hmm. Pharaoh's revenge. I'm just letting you know, man. <laughs> I did. I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, I, I want to ask you this. I want to uh, go back uh, to the question that I asked you about, you know, going to Andromeda and to another planet and, you know, w what's up with religion there. Because I don't want to say who it was, but a uh, pretty big author. He's on the show. Uh, eight nine years ago, but he tells this story on the, on the, on on the air, and he says he was here in Southern California. Light in the backyard. He goes out. He's like, "What's going on?" There's a ship in his backyard uh, out here in the mountains. Awesome. And and he, and he walks up, and they invite him on the ship, and they take off. Boom, and they head out. They leave our star system. They go to another star system, and they uh, enter the atmosphere on this planet, and they land. And he gets off of the ship, and he's walking around. And he goes up to this giant arena building thing, and there's people outside. And he walks in, and it's a convention. A, a convention. Yeah. And with booths. And things, and he's walking around this convention, and he walks up uh, to to this random booth, and he looks, and it's Jesus autographing Bibles. Okay. That's what he says. That's what he says. And he goes, "Dude, you look like Jesus." And he goes, "I am." <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, what are you doing here? And he goes, I'm selling Bibles. Sheep of another fold. And uh, he says, wow, this is crazy. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, so Why anyway. He? He's the king uh, of the so, universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do whatever you want, right? And uh, so anyway, so he comes back to Los Angeles. And he says, a couple of weeks later, another light in the backyard and he goes out, and it's not a spaceship. It's a tent. And the tent is lit up from the inside. And he goes up to the tent. He's like, who is in my backyard? And he opens up the tent door and looks in, and it's Jesus sitting there and says, come on in, man. I just wanted to come by and say hello and have a chat. And he said, so I went in, and I sat, and I talked to, I talked to Jesus in, in my backyard after I met him. And Zeta Reticuli, whatever. Wow. And now, now is crazy. That that is a fun story. It is. That's a fun story. That's the one your crazy uncle, you know, tells you. Or my great while you're camping. Yeah, yeah. Or your great grandmother. But he's got to do it with a straight face. You got to get to the end of the story, right? But I say not so fast. There's something to this story that is very like that. tangible. Yeah, I think yeah. that there's something to that. Uh, well, my great grandmother, one of her stories is that she physically she saw a physical manifestation of Jesus, but backing up, she had a stroke. It almost killed her. She was taken to the hospital. She was completely paralyzed. They didn't know if she would ever talk again, much less walk. She could not move the left side of her body. And while she's laying there in the hospital, she said Jesus walked into her hospital room physically, that he was glowing in the spirit. She said it's just absolutely the most beautiful vision of him. And he smiled at her, and suddenly the left side of her body came back. And then he turned around and walked out. And so she's like sitting up, pulling out her IV, ready to go. Doctors come in, and they're like, what happened? Because, you know, they didn't know if she was going to talk again, and she's completely recovered. And uh, she told them, Jesus came in, you know, and he healed me. And that was her personal testimony. So, you know, everybody knew that she had the stroke. Everybody knew um, all of these things. And so that was just one of those things that you could figure, okay, you know, a person who dedicates their life to, to Jesus and Spreading the gospel, I guess you could kind of expect maybe, you know, I, okay. how do you explain yeah, it? Right, you know, she right. was healed. So, 
So they left. How, that, how do you know? Well, but but John, how she identified with Jesus? Right, right. It, this guy but, did. But, but right, it could could have been could have been ET, could have been anybody, could have been a spirit. Jesus does this, and he's doing it even today. Um, I got a. Is he doing it? Is he is he doing it right now with us? He's doing it I'm somewhere. Just, I'm, right. I'm just kidding. I'm, uh, but but here's let, let's stay right here though. I love this. In Arthur C. Clarke's 2010, there's a scene in the movie. Um, somebody's mom. It, it, you have to see the movie, but she's in the hospital and she's been in a coma for years. Right, so she's all hooked up and she's in bed. What's the movie? At, uh, 2010. Uh, oh, the yeah. sequel okay. to 2001. Yeah. Okay. So this is 2010, and so um, and she's alone in her hospital room. She's got all the machines hooked up to her, and she's there. And suddenly, um, Bowman shows up on her screen. Now he's been on Jupiter, right, for years, and he's right. he's gone. He's disappeared. But anyway, the ghost of him, <laughs> staticky, shows up on her TV. She comes out of her coma, okay, and he's talking to her, staticky. She sees this, and this brush, now this is Arthur C. Clarke, floats in the air, comes off of the stand next to her hospital bed floats in the air comes over and brushes her hair just a floating brush right yeah. he sees this and she smiles the brush goes back drops off on the table and she passes away okay yeah. now that scene you can interpret so many different ways now, if you take the science fiction element out of it, you've got a religious story. Yeah. Right? You've got Arthur C. Clarke, and you've got Bowman on the screen, who's, you know, on the planet Jupiter. Now you've got a science fiction story. But yeah. how is the, you know what I mean? And and the so how do you take yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. Like with your mom or you when you met Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Or when E.T., comes down and lands and the doors come down who steps off of that what if it is jesus i never what saw him actually but i did hear him audibly so i he came to me my 21 year old uh experience was i had this vision in a dream which was a pretty insane dream jesus actually showed up in a helicopter i didn't see him it was just this helicopter landed and took me and a friend out of this really dangerous place like a cartel and we were afraid for our lives. And this, this Black Hawk comes and lands, and the door opens and says, get in. So we jump in, and he flies off. And whoever's flying this thing drops down, flies through a tunnel where a train goes through. You don't take helicopters and tunnels. But, they, you know, he flew in this tunnel, and then he comes out the tunnel, and there's these power lines right there. And we're freaking and screaming, uh, me and my friend. He does a flip around the power lines just to show off i guess you know and then he goes up into the sky and then we're cruising out over these plains and it's this beautiful golden field of wheat and the sun is rising up early in the morning and just feeling all of this incredible sense of peace and wonder and at that point in the dream i'm like who is this pilot and, and you know i i look up and the seat is indented and the controls are moving around but he's invisible and i'm like what in the world and in the dream, and just like really lost, like, and I say to my friend, I'm like, the pilot's invisible. And um, so we're just puzzled about this. And then he flies me back, lands a helicopter where he picked me up. The door opens, says, okay, get out. I get out. My friend gets out. And then he says to my friend, no, you get back in. So my friend gets back in and we're just hearing this voice. The door shuts, he flies away. And I look around and there's all these dead bodies. So whatever happened there, he just barely pulled me out of there in the nick of time. And I walk out. It's just this compound, right? Like a drug cartel compound. And the gate was left open. And I just walk out. And that's the end of the dream. And I woke up just feeling this peace, like this whole huge weight lifted off of me. And I'm like, wow, now I'm back in my life. 
And I felt like I was given an opportunity to just drop all of these addictions and things that I was doing that like, this was my golden ticket. Like if I wanted to just say, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I would be released. And so I did. I'm like, yeah, you know, but before I got there, I remember just sitting there in the bed and I'm like recalling the dream. And then I remember getting to the part where I saw the invisible pilot or didn't see him <laughs> much like. And uh, when I got to that part, I was like, who was that pilot? And I, you know, I asked the question, you know, just to myself, just pondering out loud. And I audibly heard the name Jesus spoke in my ear, like the whiskers are touching my ear, like Jesus, you know, and this energy just shot through me like love, like just his name injected me with all of this knowledge of like who he was in a way that it, it can't be erased. It can't be taken out of me. So I don't even know if what you can say I have is really faith because I, he just like said, okay, you believe now. And what I, I would have told you I was a Christian before, but I, I wasn't the way I am now. And that's what like really changed me. And so that's how I know he actually does these things sometimes. You know, he'll just show up like people that are really seeking him, even though I wasn't seeking him at that time. Not really. Right. But I, I think my great grandmother and my great grandfather were on the other side interceding for me and they saw the downward spiral and they're like, man, we got to pull him out of this because he was sabotaged when he was a toddler. You know, I, I just had so many things happen to me in my life when I was a little kid. Um, that so 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 Jesus can fly like Tom Cruise. Oh yeah, better. That makes sense too. Way better. I'm, I'm not being yeah. cavalier. I'm not. No, being, no. Way, way better. Way yeah, better. That's, that's, that's him. That's it's totally something he would do. And uh, uh, okay, so yeah. let's get back to uh, uh, the question though. So, do they have churches in Andromeda? Yes. yes. So they do. Uh, Revelation 12, 4 says the dragon dragged a third of the stars from the sky. So from that, we see that Satan managed to deceive a third of the cosmos um, of all the life, which the number of angels is innumerable. So that's a lot that are deceived. But most, two thirds, are not. Two thirds are like, imagine Adam and Eve, and then they told the snake, get lost, loser. And then... You know, they, they lived a peaceful life. They had a family and they populated the planet. They became extremely intelligent and, and, you know, they don't age. You know, they're eating from this tree. At some point, they get translated. So they, they become perfectly immortal. They don't even need to eat from the tree anymore to eat. They'll be translated and they'll be perfected in glory, just like the angels. What uh, Luke 20 36, what Jesus said. We'll, but doesn't we'll that like sound. Things. John, John, I hear you, but it's translating differently into my ear. All right. What I hear is uh, some, uh, some intelligence dropped off some DNA on this planet in a couple of test tubes with an incubator. And that's, that's, that's our Adam and Eve. That's, that's what I hear. I hear the same, you know, it, it, it's like that version of it and the perfection and the tweaking of the DNA and ages and and understanding and intelligence, all of this. I, I see it more as a, as a laboratory thing that is described to the masses differently so everybody could understand it. But I hear it differently now. I, I, it's like you brought up panspermia, right? Yeah. That's 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 what Adam and Eve was, and it could well, have been. I see a, there a being flame. different versions of Adam and Eve all over the cosmos, and then they reach this age of spiritual maturity and they translate to become angels. So they be there's you got all these different types. Some of them are glorified, but those that decided to rebel, uh, if they were not translated yet if they did not become translate into an angelic status it became mortals like us so some might hope that there's a chance for salvation so i could literally see some aliens coming here looking for information about jesus i can also see all the variation we have on this planet with all the different religions and all the confusion and stuff about people and their all their different ideas about who god is and stuff 
that that also is throughout the cosmos through that one third that were dragged away. Um, but among the higher ones, among the ones that didn't sin, mm -hmm. uh, they know who God is. And the Bible even says that the, the planet where his throne is, is in the Northern hemisphere, that the direction North is specifically mentioned three times in the Bible, referring to the highest heaven, the sides of the North, the sides of the North. So there's actually a planet out there. Uh, when Lucifer, before he sinned, it said he walked amidst the stones of fire. This was solar systems. He had his kingdom that spanned many solar systems, and he walked amidst the stones of fire. When he fell from glory, when he rebelled, and he was defeated, it says he was no longer allowed to walk amidst the stones of fire. So his axis was banned. He was restricted to this planet at that point. That's why he's thrown back down to the earth. So I always wondered, like, why are you thrown to the earth? You know, I mean, you, you got everywhere else. Why are you going to throw Satan to the earth? This was his home. This is where he lived. And when he was defeated, his kingdom was wiped out. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. A lot of people just read over that and they just assume that it's part of the original narr narrative of creation, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became void and without form. That's the second verse, right? The word void, that refers to a destruction. That's tohu. It just means the earth was destroyed. So Satan's kingdom was wiped out. It was completely destroyed. And then he was cast back down to this planet. So he was here in some sort of probably transdimensional state. And he possessed some snake, you know, and, and then screwed up this planet right from Doesn't the Doesn't it sound like uh, it, it, it's, it's so fascinating to me because it sounds like Tatooine, Luke Skywalker, Very Han much. Solo, and the Imperial Star Cruiser. Yeah. And I believe that there's a reason for that. Um, prophecy is like an energy. It's a wind. And it travels all over the world, and it's not privy to just people who believe in God. It's everybody could pick this up and then write about it and then come up with these stories. And half the time they think it's just pulling it out of thin air. But then, honestly, they're actually telling a story that's the real thing, another version of it, but it's the real thing. Um, some of the greatest oh. prophecies. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had one of the greatest prophecies. That guy was, <laughs> he was not a good guy in the beginning. No, but he had a cool ship in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the um, uh, so much is you know what I blew through the commercial. Let's just keep going. This is my show. No commercial. Are you cool with that? Or yeah, do you yeah. need? To be? Okay, all right, man. You're you're ex military. You can handle two hours of fade to black without a break. Um, yep. The um, the example. Of, I want to get specific here because so much has been made of Ezekiel's wheel and what he saw and how it was described. And it, I have read different versions of it in different Bibles too. By the way, it, it reads differently. It, it's 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 pretty strange to me. But um, what do you make of that? The wheels within wheels. And Very what key witness? Interdimensional intergalactic spaceship. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll just point out a couple of things that it talks about. Wings that are straight. They don't flap. They don't move. Okay? Wings on top, wings on the bottom, and they touch in the middle. So what you're looking at is something with wings on top and wings on bottom and they touch in the middle, meaning it's the shape of a saucer. Okay? So that's the first clue. And then, obviously, all it has to do is turn like that, and then you would see it like this. And if it's concentric wheels, if it has, you know, a wheel here, and then it's got another wheel-type thing on the top with the, with the glass dome on top, then if it turns, you're going to see wheels within wheels. And then, of course, if it has these portals all around it with lights and stuff, that could be considered like eyes, you know, like. <laughs> so there's so much about it, but obviously, you know, fire and, and the lightning and, and the thunder and stuff that this thing's got a, a lot of power it's generating. Another interesting thing about it is if there are intergalactic, interdimensional ships coming back and forth between Earth and other 
you know, solar systems and whatnot, uh, other galaxies. Um, it would have to be able to punch in and out of this dimension. And we have the science and the math to be able to do this. Uh, quantum physics has maybe uh, calculated it, that if we had enough power, we could fold space and then basically create our own wormholes, right? So if this thing is exactly this, this interdimensional inter uh, galactic ship, it's able to create wormholes wherever it wants. Now, this in the Hebrews described as the Merkaba, uh, God's mm -hmm. portable throne, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they see this thing, this wheel within wheels, with the angels, because it is some kind of angelic craft, because there's angels associated with it. But then above it is like this portal that opens up, and you see God on his throne, right? So that's something totally that a spaceship like this could do. It could create a wormhole and open up and show you God's throne, wherever his throne is. So he's on this other planet in the northern hemisphere, the cosmos, and this ship comes around wherever it goes, and it could just open this portal up and show you God on his throne. And I think that that's exactly what he saw, and it, he communicates with the angels, and it, and it even says that they took him up in it, uh, and then you have other scriptures that you can kind of bounce off of that. They were probably the same thing, the same kind of ship. The uh, the angelic chariot that took uh, Elijah in the book of Second Kings. Uh, there, there's all these references to angelic chariots. And they probably have all kinds of different models. But this one that Ezekiel saw was obviously the, you know, one of the main Cadillac models that they have. Um and I also speculate that there might be some angels, just like Star Trek, you know, you have Q, right? Does Q need a spaceship? No. He could teleport, right? So I think Satan probably, Lucifer had enough power to be able to just pop in and out, you know, to just at will teleport himself to other planets because he traveled amidst the stones of fire. Um, he was powerful to do that possibly, but other angels, the, the bulk of them, they require vehicles. You know, so angels, nowhere in the Bible does it say angels are unlimited. So that's why when you see descriptions of these, the good guys, and the Bible just basically kind of blends them together and says that this is God, but it, it's not God. God created the angels and then he delegated to them. But he's a very personal being. He's the Jesus who will ride with you in a helicopter, right? So he'll go and show up in these spaceships and he'll hang out with them. And there was that big column of fire above Israel for 40 years, feeding them when they're out in the desert. It split the, the ocean or the Red Sea. This is an anti-gravity beam that it shot down, initiated from Moses' staff, and the water literally split. And it said that there were walls. It wasn't wind blowing. That was some kind of gravitational force field splitting the water so that they could cross on dry ground. And there's this big thing, this column of fire up in the sky. That is a UFO. Yeah, so I would yeah, agree yeah. with Von Donikin on that, but yeah, yeah, at the same yeah. time, I'm not going to cross the bridge and say that uh, God is an alien. I don't believe he is. I believe God is distinct, and God has very many characteristics that are immutable. They only apply to him, and that's where I'm really staking my claim. Uh, the mission of my writing is Revelation 14.6, because in the middle of all of these things in the end times prophecy of Jesus, for example, said, in the end times, when I return, it'll be like the days of Noah. So Jesus said, in the end times, we're going to be seeing all this crazy stuff going on in the sky. There's going to be all these otherworldly things, and the things that were going on in the days of Noah are going to be happening on the days when I return. And the same deceptions with them. So the watchers, they were not good guys. They wanted to be worshipped like gods, right? So Jesus was warning us, some otherworldly beings are coming back. And they're going to have the same deception. They might put a new skin on it, have a more scientific flavor, but it's the same deception. And that angel right in the middle of all of this is flying in the heavens. So this is a glorified angel faithful to God who is flying in the heavens yet preaching to the people of earth. So my opinion, that might very well be just like the angels that picked up your friend and took him to the planet where they had the convention, right? Those were probably good guys. And they just defy a lot of conventional Christian thinking because we don't see the Bible like Star Wars or whatever, but it actually is. 
It is a war between good and evil, between light and dark. It's been going on a long time. And the human race and on this planet is where the war is going to come to a head. It's all going to come closing down to the end. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. And you see this angel flying in the heavens saying, worship the creator, the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars and the creatures and all of the things that we see in the universe. So he's reminding people who the creator are, like, like we're forgetting that. We're getting shown all these different versions of who the creator is and, you know, uh, getting confused about it. And he's just clarifying. It. It's very simple. There is a God. He created you. He created everything. And he's the one you should be worshiping because there's going to be all kinds of distractions and things coming up in the future that are going to be telling people a completely different message. Now, yeah. it, it, the and this, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. Well, I'm a lot confused. Uh, but that's a, another story. Not not about not about you. The, the universe is a big, 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 big place with trillions and trillions of galaxies, and each mm-hmm. one of those galaxies has a trillion stars, and each one of those stars has at least one planet. We are talking about something frigging ginormous beyond our comprehension. Why, why Earth uh, bigger than that? <laughs> right? and so, yeah. but, uh, but, but why Earth to have this revelation, or is the revelation happening simultaneously on all of these other worlds throughout the universe? It's, I'm it a is. little confused. What makes us yeah. special, or is it going on everywhere? Well, like, that's uh, another area where I'm a little ones. different than a lot of Christians, is that um, the war is coming to an end on Earth because the rebellion was started on Earth before humanity was ever even created. Why? What makes what makes Lucifer, Earth so special? Lucifer. This was his home. And he was the first one to defy God and rebel against him. So the deception, the original deception that even predates Adam and Eve by mm. millions, billions of years, it started here on this planet. And God destroyed this entire solar system. And there's evidence of it. You could see how Mars had a major destruction. The rings yeah. of Saturn, the, the, the rings are actually perpendicular to its orbit around the sun. So it's it's really weird. Something smacked And it's really full hard. of debris. Yeah, it's full of debris. No doubt right. about it. And we have the asteroid belt. Yes. Explain that. I believe so, there was a planet. I believe but, there was but, a planet there, and, it, and Michael blew it up. But there's got to be, I would think, um, and I've, I've upset a lot of people when I say this, but but I truly mean it. There must be a trillion planets out there nicer and cooler than Earth. <laughs> easy, easy. So why we, we why, have a wobble, right? So we have these pretty radical temperature dis- differences on the planet. There's probably planets out there that are like spring all the time. All the time. I totally yeah. agree. I, why would you vacation here? Well, Vegas is pretty cool sometimes. Right, yeah. and, I mean, and if you and want, I, if you want to experience that extreme and go to Antarctica <laughs> just to say, okay, this is cool, it's cold. But right, um, right, 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 know. right, right. But but I often ask myself that, you know, what makes? Uh, I don't want to have a centrist feeling that we. I don't want to let my ego get too strong to think that we are special. Because right. there's well, a I lot of special out there. I think it's it's ending here because it started here. The war started here on this planet. So God is ending it on this planet. Jesus picked Earth to come here as to incarnate into this universe because he knew that this planet was where the deception would start, where the rebellion would start. So he would end it at the same place it started. So he became a human being, a incarnated as the firstborn of all creation here on Earth. And then he he actually defeated the enemy here on the cross in the past. And then everything happens after that. And then he's going to actually relocate the planet where the capital of the universe is located in the northern hemisphere. He's taking this whole city and he's moving it to Earth. And it's because it's like this is what you would do in a war, right? 
you go, you take the enemy's territory, and then you plant your base there. Boom. Here's our new capital. And he's making this, he's glorifying this planet again to make it all new. Uh, I, I talk about this, and the, the earth is actually a multidimensional construct. Uh, the Bible even describes it like hell is in the heart of the earth. And there's a whole civilization down there. It's because it's a smaller planet in a lower dimension. Earth is like a, a, an onion of lithospheres with all these layers of dimensional existence to it. And quantum physics is catching up to see that. Uh, M theory speculates, according to the math, there's 11 dimensions. So we know that there's this multidimensional structure to our universe. And the earth is multidimensional. The whole universe is multidimensional. There's a higher realm above our heads. So we're actually in the middle earth right now. Uh, there's a higher realm. Earth's a bigger planet in a higher, more glorified universe. And it's it's above our heads. But it's a civilization much like this one. And there's power. Who, who, and who, who lives there? So another civilization like us, but yes. we don't see it because they're dimensionally just off by a frequency or two. Yeah. Like if we changed our frequency, we would be embedded in probably magma, right? Because we would be inside of a much larger planet. I actually talk about this in one of my fiction books, the, the, uh, the dark world paradox. And it describes the whole construct of these ideas, right? Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Universe, the, uh, an alien comes here to rescue a Bigfoot to take him back to his home world. That's what the story is about. But I talk about all these different concepts. Like they actually have to commandeer a jet, fly into the upper atmosphere, open a portal, punch through it to the higher dimension. And then they find themselves in a much larger planet. And um, the guy that's with the alien lady, he can only stay there for a little while until this device that he has, you know, it allows him to stay there with his frequency change. But that's the gist of it. And the Bible even talks about it in the book of Daniel. When the prophet Daniel's praying, Gabriel comes to this planet to deliver a message, and he has to battle his way through. He's detained for 21 days. So it's even specific about the days, right, that he's detained by the prince of Persia, which is this powerful entity in the first heaven. So they stop him. They detain him. Michael goes and fights and gets him out, breaks him out, does a recon mission, breaks him out of the jail wherever they have him, so he can get through, deliver his message. And then he says when he's leaving, he has to go through again. So you see the whole structure there. He punches through this first dimension to get down to Daniel. Then he has to go back through that first dimension to go back to heaven where he came from, or the heavens. He could have either come from the planet to report to God or his own home world because the, the cosmos is like two-thirds of it is glorified worlds. One third of it, they're fallen. So you have all of these other beings that are like us, probably, you know, just as lost and confused about God and everything as we are. Uh, but then the bulk of it out there is in a higher dimension that's glorified. Satan can't access that realm anymore. He was banned from that. But he certainly has a lot of power here. And he does have power over the first dimension of heaven here, he the first heaven. Because Bible says that he's the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. So he still has a lot of power here on this planet, but it's not unlimited. There's this. What does he? What is, what is he? What does he look like? He's a human. The Bible even describes him as a man. Now, can he shape shift? Probably. He could turn right. into a, a lizard. And so there's all these people that talk about him being reptilian and whatnot. I don't think so. He's he's a watcher. He's with the watchers in the Book of Job in chapter one. When Satan appears before God's throne, he's with the Benai Elohim. He's one of these watchers. So if you read the book of Enoch, there's this whole list of names. He's one of them, like Samza or whatever. He's one of them, uh, Azazel. So there's a couple names that I read, and it's like uh, Azazel, I think, was the one who taught all the sorcery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you could kind of gather on some of them, uh, but... But who knows which one of them by name that Lucifer could, could Satan could Satan grow up and mature and turn over a new leaf? No, he no. is what he is. Do you remember? Um, have you seen? That's the read, whole point. That's the whole point of all this well, well, and well, why well, it's well, taking well, so long. I, I, I love this part. Yeah. Um, have you read or seen? And if you haven't seen it, uh, there's a great three part movie. Uh, childhood's end. Have you no. seen it? Okay. 
Let me write it down. It's, it's a short, it's a book by Arthur C. Clarke. It was written in the 50s. And now it's a three-part movie. Write it down. Childhoods with an S. Yeah. Childhoods end. The end of childhood, right? Childhoods yeah. end. Yeah. All right. You need to watch it. Watch it after you watch Three Body <laughs> Problem. But anyway, um, what is interesting about that is um, E.T. comes, right? Got a spaceship. Uh, it doesn't have Tom Cruise in it, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, Kraft comes down and and picks an ambassador. And the ambassador is this guy out in the middle of Kansas. He has a farm and whatever. But he's taken uh, to this hotel room. It's on the spaceship, but it's made to look like a hotel room. There's a mirror. E.T. is behind the mirror talking to him. Won't show himself to dude. Mm -hmm. Why? So the camera comes across and goes through the mirror, and then you see E.T. That is talking in a normal voice, and we're here to help you. We're going to... We're going to cure all diseases. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to take care of it. Nobody has to work anymore. And, and you know, it's going to be a wonderful life, right? And we need you to tell this to the world. So, meanwhile, the camera goes into the other room and says, I, but I can't show myself. You need to do the communication. I'm just going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make so everything human -looking right. Thing, I bet. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, the camera goes into the other room. And it's... Satan. The devil, yeah. <laughs> Horn, yeah, yeah. Horns, hoods, yeah. red, um, bat bat wings, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. yeah, yeah, he's 10 feet tall, yellow eyes, you know. I mean, just gnarly. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's a crazy, now, it's like a weird metaphor, too, uh, the way that Arthur C. Car Clark presents it. But, um, that version of it, uh, of E.T., if the world saw it with all of the religions and the way that we painted these pictures, right, over the years, that would be impossible to deal with. Why and would he look like that? He can make it yeah. however he wants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Watch the movie. It's, it's yeah. really good. It's really good. Oh, well, yeah. um, so... When we see, like right now, we have all of this, uh, you know, you're ex-military, so you understand how the military is. I do. I'm a military brat, right? Grew up yeah. on military bases. There's a certain protocol and belief system, and everything's got a number, and everything's got a form, and everything, you know, and you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, rules regulations for and, your and teeth. Regu regulations. That's just the way that it is. And to see regulation get broken, uh, where suddenly Washington and the military and the Department of Defense and the Navy and everybody is talking about UFOs and sightings and video and eyewitness testimony and, and everything that is that has happened what is actually going on there in the view of Christian ufology? You know, yeah. what, what is the Tic Tac? And if somebody is visiting us from another planet, who are they or are they us? How, what's the view of Christian ufology when it comes to what is happening right now with, with Congress and Washington DC and, and the Pentagon? So it's a sign Okay, that's the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus saying we'll return to the days of Noah. Uh, I do believe because of that prophecy, we will see disclosure. However, the Bible also talks about something called, you know, a taking of the taking away, so that there's going to be, and if angels are doing this, they literally would be flying over in spaceships and taking people off the planet. The Bible refers to this as a taking away. In Latin, it's translated as rapture. So there's lots of debates. So, oh, you're pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, you know, when's the rapture? And they call it an escapist doctrine, you know, some people, because it's like, oh, you just want to escape, you know, persecution. And But, I mean, Jesus literally said, 
you know, you should pray that you could escape it, you know? <laughs> so why would he say that unless it weren't on the table at least? But I think that there will likely be a mass alien abduction but that will be the rapture. And a lot of Christians are going to be like finding themselves in a spaceship with these really cool looking humanoid aliens, but they'll, you know, they'll be looking at the spaceship and kind of like, what is going on? And they'll be debriefed, you know, um, and taken to a glorified place. And it'll make sense, you know, it'll make sense to them. But after this rapture occurs, that's the one taken out of the way. So in 2 Thessalonians, it says that there will be, the Antichrist can't reveal himself until the restrainer is taken out of the way. So what's restraining? Well, I mentioned it before that um, that there's checks and balances right here on this planet. Satan may be the prince of the power of the air, but he can only do certain things without disrupting this balance. And he's an expert at walking that thin line and convincing others to do his dirty work without doing it himself. So that's how he manages to navigate and still retain some power, at least in this planet. And he's given this role. He's actually allowed to deceive the planet to the best of his ability, anybody who's willing to listen to him. So he picks his avatar, who's the Antichrist. And at some point, he's even going to straight up possess this guy. Uh, but it's going to be a person. Actually, there's more than one Antichrist, so I can only hear people debate about that and there have been multiple antichrists throughout the, the the millennia antiochus epiphanes nero even hitler um they're like antichrist warming up right it's his same spirit and I, I believe hitler probably was possessed by the antichrist but didn't quite pull off what he was trying to do so each time he comes back he tries again eventually i think the antichrist is going to end up being some kind of a nephilim the capstone achievement of all this genetic tinkering that they've been doing is going to create a perfect human. This guy is going to be charismatic, and he's going to be just so incredible. Just his talking will be able to hypnotize people. Um, I talked Tom Cruise. About it's Tom Cruise. I knew it. I knew uh, it. It's Tom Cruise. Yeah. It's Maverick. It's Maverick. Yeah. Maverick and, is. And this, there's other worldly Jesus is going to show up, and uh, I call him the false prophet. He's going to be coming down between two, between the wings of two angels, according to some ancient texts, descending to the earth in, in this like grandiose display. And then he will give his, he will basically say, you need to believe and follow this guy. So basically mimicking what John the Baptist did with Jesus, right? But this fake Jesus is going to say, listen to what this guy tells you. And he's going to give all of his credence to this Antichrist character. But the interesting thing about Revelation when you're reading it is like you're seeing all of these things unfolding even today. Um, AI technology, for example. Hey, spot That's on the money. Revelation you... chapter 13 right there. The image of the yeah. beast is a man-made entity. It can think. And what is it given? It's given control of global commerce. And it also implements a global tracking device. So your cell phone is basically the first step of that. Everybody got a cell phone now. What does it do? It tracks everything you do. It's a global tracking device. And that will eventually become integrated into a chip that'll solve all kinds of problems like uh, vaccination. You know, they may be able to make you take this vaccine now. They'll be able to make you do whatever they want you to do. The currency, what's the currency doing? They're trying to push digital currency and integrate that into this same technology, digital passport, all of it. It's all converging into the same thing. And it's going to be part of this system, and it'll be controlled by an artificial intelligence. I think eventually it will end up becoming this android that'll be integrated with the internet. And he will be like totally fascinating, just this amazing person. And he'll control everything in his head. Why do we, why, why does ET slash God, right? No, let's, I'm, I'm going there even allow this to happen why 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 go through it why just not come in and just wipe the slate clean start over free will so god created us with free will and free will mandates that you have to allow a choice and you need there to be a balance so that choice is a product of what's in your heart it's what you want it's what you choose so when he says 
I want you to live in a certain way and I want you to be treating each other like, you know, in a certain way as, as he lays out with ethics and everything, right? And there's certain things that God wants and he wants them the way he wants them. And people have their own ideas. Ever since Adam and Eve, they were taught, you know, hey, you can be your own God. You know, you don't you don't have to listen to this. You don't have to follow these rules. And besides, uh, Satan convinced them to start questioning everything that God told them to do. But God wants that. He wants us to have those questions and then for us to make up our own mind to become faithful to him by our choice because we love him. So he's all about love. Everything that God does is based and centered on love. So anything that contradicts that, if you don't want to be part of that, then God allows Satan to create whatever alternative he can come up with to try to appeal to you that's something other than love. And that's what's that's why it's there. That's why we're going through all of this, because God, honestly, he has the ability to wipe out anything. He can destroy all creation and start all over again if he wanted to. But he wants children, and he wants there to be a very peaceful and glorified and happy existence like there was before Lucifer sinned. So this is a piece of that rebellious nature that he wants dealt with in a way that it's, it's the only way to deal with it. You just have to let it run its course. And so he may expedite it, try to expedite it, even though on our time scale it maybe certainly doesn't seem like it. Uh, Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, so like, why hasn't he come back? But uh, I, I honestly think it's yeah, coming that's, through. That's, 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 you're right about it. I mean, it's all confusing I, because you have to – you have to consider our own reality, too. God created Van Halen, but he also created Justin Bieber, right? <laughs> so, you know, you have to understand that, yeah, I can see the free will part of it coming into play. But if we, if we back up and back up and back up where physics is, is rolling back and examining things, and 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 constantly looking deeper into the past in the universe. That's what the James Webb Space Telescope was built for, right? To go back and peer back and look back and look back. The question that I have is if we go back and we see something, then if it is divine or if it is spiritual or if it was created, something had to create that. And if that is the case, then God had to have had parents. Something came before him or whatever. That's, he's that's an enigmatic nature that we will not be able to grasp because that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, it, when, when it comes to that, I've always not looked at things, theology, by the way. Well, it, it's also Jimmy Church's theology because yeah. I, I'll explain it like this. No matter what, forever is a long time. It's a long time. Yeah. It's forever. But God so, is beyond time. The Father's beyond time. That's why his name is I Am. Like, eternally always present. That's no matter where he's at. And it, it, it transcends time. Uh, he's the Ancient of Days. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So these are titles that kind of give us an idea of He's so far beyond us, we can't even begin to comprehend him. Uh, we try to, and it's human nature to shrink him down, to demote him to something that we can understand. Uh, someone with parents, somebody with a beginning, with an origin story. But God has no origin story. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's even beyond time. Time, he created time. So well, okay. So we have we have man, and we have uh, we have ten minutes left. Speaking of time, okay, yeah, we have man. We have us, right? That's just a short piece of time. What about the dinosaurs? Oh yeah, God, they, they were in so Satan's kingdom, right? Satan sinned. Uh, I think that God had a very long leash with him that potentially lasted millions, perhaps billions of years, where 
he would cross the line and God would say, no, stop. So like you could look in the stratus of the earth, right? The geological structure of the earth. They, uh, biology textbooks talk about, um, uh, or geology textbook say that there was at least five catastrophic destructions of this planet, earth killer events that happened on this planet. Of course, a comet was the main one off the, the coast of um, Florida. And it's under the ocean. It's about a hundred mile crater out there. But they say that, that you know, we've had five uh, mass extinction events on this planet, right? Well, those could have been times at, at some point when, you know, Satan crossed the line, God punished him, start over again. You know, you, you got this civilization, um, Atlantis, for example. Um, Atlantis was filled with angelic beings and mortals, according to the descriptions. And God judged that that nation. Uh, they became very corrupt. You know, same story that you see in Genesis 6-4. Um, God destroyed it. So you had all this history on this planet of advanced civilizations rising to an apex, becoming corrupt, and then God wiping them out. Satan was in charge of all of that time before Adam and Eve. So you can expect a lot of that. And I think the dinosaurs very well could have been genetic tinkering back then. Uh, a lot of the things dating back to the dinosaur days seem to have that element of overly large creatures that, that didn't even seem natural, like in terms of carnivorous appetite. How did the planet support them? Uh, well, different, we had different gravity, I think. Yeah, oh, that, a different that's atmosphere. True. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'm not it's kidding. Possible. Yeah, I'm yeah not but kidding. I, I think that they might have been genetically tinkering back then, and that this whole product of Nephilim. They had Nephilim before the flood, before Adam and Eve even, because you had, if they started out like Adam and Eve did, like I believe angels start out as a reproductive species, they populate their planet. And when they reach a spiritual maturity, they translate into this angelic form that no longer reproduces. That explains why angels were attracted to human women to begin with. Uh, they have that past and a familiarization with it. It's just that when you become a translated being, you're like a butterfly. You metamorphose into this new state of being, and you don't do that anymore. But they sinned, and they went against that new nature and reverted to their former nature. And that, that was really bad because it was catastrophic. It led to the flood of Noah. So is it is it that, uh, and, and by the way, John, Unbelievably great conversation tonight, but it's just perfect on every level. Um, when we look at and when we see, I'll just grab a movie, Independence Day, yeah, right, where uh, you know, ET shows up. Uh, if it could be a rival, it doesn't really matter, just pick one, pick, pick a movie. And uh, but let's stay with Independence Day. So they arrive over Los Angeles, what happens? You have uh, the the people that are expecting aliens, ET, to come and save us. Look at look, any Marvel movie, right? <laughs> yeah. it, has, it has all of this. So, but we expect that. Now, let's say if it pans out the way that you're presenting it here, ET shows up, the mothership. It shows up rapture, whatever you want to call it, but the the mothership is above us. Is 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 that ET going to be in a religious context and present itself that way, or is it going to be technological? Right, the rapture, I believe, will be technological, but it will be so stealthful, people will just be gone. Uh just like poof, you're teleported out like Star Trek. Um, because the, the rapture, it's described as, you know, it, the blink of an eye, he says in scripture. When Jesus says he'll, he'll come from the east to the west, he'll circle the globe from east to west. So you won't even see it. You won't even see it. Probably won't even see it. Uh, these are the good guys. The good guys are very stealthful because their technology is superior that, to those that have fallen. You know, um, the ones that are fallen, they're still, they got a lot of their technology and they got a lot of the know-how. They're obviously very intelligent and very powerful. They can mimic a lot of things and stuff. But God's faithful angels are like well more ahead 
and and then plus God has their back. So <laughs> God could do anything. Um, but, but you would have to listen to Christian rock and roll. Ah! Oh, not so bad. <laughs> you know, you know what's really funny. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. I want to say who it is. He's listening right now. Um, and uh, just man devoted, and I and I love it. I appreciate it, and I really push the humor with him. Right, and uh, so I said, "So what are you doing today?" Because man, I'm running sound. For what? <laughs> Dude, uh, we're having a Christian rock revival this weekend. No, you're not. Yeah, we are. I said, no, you're confusing music and rock when you say Christian. He goes, oh, no. And it's so funny how they so quickly, I say they, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Rush to the defense. Oh, no, you don't get it. Yeah. It's great music. No, it's just listen. I'm like, no, 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 dude. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, I love it. And uh, I think it's great. And, uh, but uh, I don't know if I could take eternity without Van Halen. Oh. Well, what about, what about, what, dude, we don't have Black Sabbath in heaven in the rapture? Uh, there's, no, there's no Ozzy. There. There's music no Ozzy. No, Oz, no Ozzy. No Pantera. Let, let me just put it to you this way <laughs> I, I experienced a vision of heaven, and the music they have there is so beyond anything we've got here mm -hmm. that. Your ears would bleed to listen to anything else. I mean, it, it would destroy music as you knew it to hear it for just oh, a somebody minute. Says, uh, look, Amy Grant. Amy Grant. Now, I like Amy Grant, but hold on, hold on. Check this out. Outcast Jeff just, he popped up with Striper. <laughs> <laughs> Striper. No, see, now you're dated, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The music oh, has to, come I, along, you know. I used, to go see, I, I used to go see Striper in the clubs here in L.A. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They're a good band. They're a good band. Pioneer uh, high too. school, you man. Too. You too, man. I mean, they're, they're really good. I like them. Yeah. Amy Grant. I love that though. Amy Grant. Amy yeah. Grant. I was in love with Amy Grant when I was a kid, man. She's going, just... going back to your, your independence day thing though. I mean, you, for the first part of that is the stealth part, right? We won't even see them. Boom. Gone. Right. The second part, if you read Daniel chapter eight, it's just crazy, right? So you got the dragon in Revelation 12, four dragging the stars and throwing them down to the earth. So, you know, there's otherworldly activity happening here on the planet, but it's, it's more colorful than that. There's factions, right? Because here you have like two antichrists, right? This, this beast with two heads and they're like at war with each other. So there's this sort of false flag thing going on where you got a fake enemy and a, and a, and another one fighting so you think they're fighting for you but in fact they're actually both bad right so one's pretending to be a good guy and they're aligning with different nations and that's what we that's what we see now right the united states is aligned with some ets probably russia is aligned with some ets china maybe with some ets they all have their own little factions and they might have different agendas right and if they're if they're part of Satan's team, they might even be warring against each other because they're not all on the same sheet of music either. Satan, the, it's because he's a master at organizing chaos, right? He can use all of these warring factions, chaos, you know, and fighting against each other and manipulate them to get his outcome. He's just using them, right? And Revela uh, Daniel 8 talks about the hosts of the heaven coming down and fighting uh, so there's going to be wars here on earth between us, you know, countries fighting each other, you know, like Israel and Hamas right now, right? It is war over there. But in the heavens, that's going to be bleeding over into this dimension. So you may very well even see ships, ships up in the sky, just like Independence Day, but warring factions from other worlds. Like, oh, there's a reptilians and they're fighting from the, you know, uh, Orion Belt or the Pleiadians or the Nordics or whatever. All these different ET factions, they're going to be playing a role here, and they'll have pieces of this battle that's going to be going on. It's probably going to be going all over the planet, but I do see that as very likely that we're going to have otherworldly beings here interfacing with humanity, part of our society, and when wars break out, they actually involve them as well. It's going to be, it's going to be intense.
John Myler, perfect show, my friend. Perfect show. I look forward to our next conversation. And we've got your links, johnmyler.com. They're below over on our website and throughout social media. Everybody go and check out John's books and everything that he is doing right now. John, I want you to behave and enjoy your weekend. Thank you so right. much, my brother. Thank you very much. All right. Perfect show. Thank you so much. John Myler. And again, I've got links for John below, social media, on the website. Got him in the chat, too, as well. This is Fade to Black. Like I said, this is my Friday. So I'm about to go and start my weekend. I'm going to go and try to finish this weekend. I got uh, uh, 10 episodes left of Three Body, the Chinese version. There's 30 episodes there. So I'm going to go and, and do that right now. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Dex. I love saying that. Thank you, Jonicide. That's right. I saw that Slayer in there, Jonicide. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. And it cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Hey, we talked about Striper tonight. When does that ever happen? I want you to be safe. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Go back, Lee Tappy.